Professor R. Ashokamani, former professor and head of the Department of Physics at Anna University, Chennai, and presently guiding five research scholars. He has more than 40 years of UG and PG teaching experience and 25 years of research experience. 14 research scholars have obtained doctorate under his guidance in the area of solid state physics. He has more than 150 research publications to his credit, of which 90 are in international journals. He has authored a book on solid state physics which has an international publication. He has participated in several international conferences both in India and abroad. He is a fellow and treasurer of Tamil Nadu Academy of Sciences. Welcome to the UGC lecture series in applied electronics and this paper with which the students are dealing is on physics of materials. In this chapter, we have bondings in solids and this is a lecture number 9 and uh, so far we have been talking about uh, different kinds of bondings namely ionic, covalent and metallic bonding. They are called the primary bondings which uh, implies that the bonding strength in these systems are uh, very large compared to the so called secondary bonding and uh, Van der Waals bonding comes under the secondary bonding. And uh, also we will be talking today about uh, mixed bonding and the contents of uh, today's lecture are as follows Van der Waals bonding, Leonard Jones potential, comparison between primary bonds and the secondary bonds, mixed bonding and charge density contours in ionic and covalently bonded solids. And uh, as I mentioned just now, apart from primary bonding, we have got weak secondary bonding and this weak secondary bonding as I told you in the previous lecture arises because of uh, the interactions between the induced dipoles, sometimes the induced dipoles and polar molecules and lastly the polar molecules. Now, hydrogen bonding as I told you is a special case of um, secondary bonding and uh, in the last lecture we were uh, talking about the secondary bonding, the so called fluctuating dipoles because of the asymmetric charge density distribution and you have a dipole here, a dipole here, a neutral atom becomes a dipole and these dipoles start attracting each other in the secondary bonding and you have got permanent dipole moments possessed by a molecule like uh, HCl because this chlorine looks at the hydrogen, the electron cloud of chlorine is uh, looking at the proton of the hydrogen atom because the other electron is uh, shared between the hydrogen and chlorine because of covalent bonding. Now, because of this between the two HCl systems right the hydrogen chloride molecules there will be you know there will be secondary bonding right. Now, let me not uh, go into the details of course, we have completed the secondary bonding we will directly go to the Van der Waals bonding. The Van der Waals bonding arises due to the dipole dipole interaction. So, you got dipoles and as I told you earlier the origin of the dipole moment of the molecule of the atoms like uh, argon, krypton, xenon, radon you know they are the inert gas structures, they are the inert gases, the, they are the elements found in the 
last group of the periodic table the inert gases the helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon and they have apart from helium they have the octet structure S 2 p 6 configuration all ending with S 2 p 6 that means, the electronic charge density is uh, spherically symmetric and uh, there is no reason because the atoms should be neutral and uh, you may wonder as to how the atoms acquire dipole moments. The fact that the atoms become dipoles cannot be explained on the basis of uh, classical physics and one has to make use of uh, quantum mechanical ideas to explain the uh, fact that uh, the dipole moments are induced into the atoms. Anyway, the potential that operates between the atoms or the molecules in gases can in general be explained on the basis of uh, the well known or famous Leonard Jones potential. And so, I will be dealing with the Leonard Jones potential because it has been very widely used in condensed matter physics. Whenever you have got uh, properties to be explained for gases, you make use of uh, Leonard Jones potential and you have got a atom or molecule here, atom or molecule here. What is the potential that operates or the force that is operating or the potential experienced by this atom or molecule by the other atom or molecule and you have got one at rest at the origin, the other is coming from infinite distance towards this uh, atom or molecule the species and then the potential energy will will have to be negative right otherwise there will be no attraction the formation of uh, the you know the, the argon can be solidified other than helium all of them can be solidified you have a solid xenon solid argon and so on. So, the fact that the gases are liquefied and then solidified they it implies that that should be a force of attraction that will be operating between the atoms or molecules. Now, therefore, the interaction will be negative that is what I am trying to tell you you have got an atom here organ atom here another organ atom here when this organ atom is at a far off distance any uh, you know potential force the long range apart from the nuclear force other things are long range. So, the you know it will be existing for a wide for a long distance, but anyway it will be very small almost 0 and then when the organ atom is brought closer and closer right you find that uh, you know the negative it is below 0 negative means that means the bonding occurs right a negative in physics in this region refers to attraction and you have the potential this is the potential energy as a function of r right. So, r is the distance separating the two atoms or molecules you have got an organ atom here. Now, this is the equilibrium interatomic separation right if you have got a one organ atom here another organ atom here this is the distance which uh, is called the equilibrium interatomic separation this height that is the, the the magnitude of this refers to the cohesive energy or the binding energy. In the very first lecture I told you about the cohesive energy of crystals in any system bound state system whether it is hydrogen atom or hydrogen molecule or any other solid like ionic solid covalent solid the the potential energy profile will be looking similar to this right only the height will be smaller or larger here it will be shallow indicating what does it indicate what is what, what does it mean the shallow potential means the the weakness or the smaller amount of uh, the force operating between the two atoms or molecule molecules that means the bonding is weak so the 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 depth of the potential is smaller means the bonding is weaker i told you in the last lecture how when i discuss about thermal expansion in one case the potential is very deep in the other one it is not so very deep so, the depth of the potential well indicates the strength of the bond. So, the bond is weak the shallowness uh, you know if it goes very deep right then the bond strength is very large. So, the bonding is weak in the case of uh, it is a weak 
van der Waals bond. Van der Waals bonding is weak. I will show the magnitudes later. So, this potential function u of r that you have got here v of r or u of r will be given as 4 into epsilon into sigma by r to the power of 12 minus sigma by r to the power of 6 right. Now, uh, this uh, attractive potential term is there there is a uh, you know there is attractive potential term with a negative sign the attractive term this is a uh, repulsive term that occurs with a power law 12 here the power is 6. So, this one is the potential energy curve or profile for a van der Waals solid right this should be remembered and um, Leonard Jones potential form should be remembered right that is very important right because it is widely used as a model potential where in very many calculations involving um, gases or liquids and uh, solids even in the case of uh, nanomaterials people start with uh, Leonard Jones potential and so the epsilon here uh, refers to the depth of the potential well where is the depth this is the depth right from the origin the you know up to this is called the depth of the potential in the potential well there is a depth. What is the meaning of the depth that refers to the bond strength the depth is large the bond strength is very large the depth is small the bond strength is low. Then sigma is an important parameter it is a finite distance at which the interparticle potential becomes 0 where is sigma here sigma is found here right this is sigma the interparticle potential you got one atom here another atom here. So, the interatomic or the interparticle distance it becomes uh, 0 for this distance right when the distance is uh, this much the potential is this much and so on it becomes 0 exactly for this. So, this is the sigma uh, from 0 to this line this point that is sigma that is called uh, sigma here the interparticle distance at which the potential becomes 0 and epsilon is the depth of the potential and r is of course, the distance that separates the atom at the origin and the atom at any other point or is a variable right or is a variable that you have along the x axis right. This is the potential energy profile right that is very important in the Leonard Jones potential right. Now, r to the power of minus 12 term that you had there is a repulsive term which arises because of the Pauli principle at short ranges right. Whereas, this uh, r to the power of minus 6 term is the attractive long range term Lj potential is used to describe the properties of gases not only the properties of gases, but you know it is particularly accurate for noble gases right this is a very important point for noble gases are like um, xenon, argon, krypton for noble gases the Leonard Jones potential is uh, able to accurately describe the characteristic features of uh, the those gases. It is a good approximation at long and short distances for neutral atoms and molecules. It is also widely used in computational modeling of uh, potentials in solid state or condensed matter physics. So, van der Waals bonding mainly arises due to dipole dipole interaction you have got an instant dipole here dipole here the dipole dipole interaction is uh, the reason for the van der Waals bonding right. Origin of dipole moment in neutral helium, neon, argon, krypton or other molecules cannot be explained by classical physics as I told you it is only from quantum mechanics or using the Leonard Jones potential one can explain the van der Waals bonding. Van der Waals bonding what are the properties it is a weak bond as I told you among the you have got a primary bond they are very strong it is a secondary bond it is a weaker bond of course, hydrogen bond is much stronger right the van der Waals bond is a weaker bond the energy having uh, on the order of uh, 10 kilojoules per mole secondary bonding the example the inert gases between molecules that are covalently bonded arises from molecular dipoles right. Now, let me compare the different types of bondings right. Now, what do you understand from the different kinds of bondings. Now, let us go to the type the ionic bonding 
the bond energy is large right compared to very many other cases the bond energy is large and uh, the other comment that should be made the bonding is non directional you take any ceramic pot you, you take a coffee cup made up of uh, ceramic it is uh, the bonding is uh, mostly ionic bonding take barium titanate and so on is ionically or NaCl is ionic solid. Now, in these solids the bonding is uh, ionic obviously the bonding is non directional right and that is what has been shown here. Here you observe you have got uh, the chlorine atom will be here right you have got sodium atom here this electronic charge density distribution in NaCl right how the electrons are distributed you do not consider the electrons as particles right you have the equivalent electronic charge density cloud this is a cloud right you have got a cloud here you have got an electronic charge density cloud you have got the rings and uh, so here there is no it is not directional. So, we have been so discussing so far about uh, the van der Waals bonding and uh, the things like uh, a comparison between different kinds of bondings. Now, we have been comparing the different kinds of bondings that occur in solids and uh, in the case of ionic bonding I told you that the bonding is non directional. What do you mean by the by the statement bonding is non directional? Now, it, it becomes much clearer when you look at this graph right. This uh, electronic this is the electronic charge and distribution in the case of G e what is G e? Germanium between one germanium atom here you got a germanium atom here another germanium atom here what is germanium is it a metal or a ionically bonded solid or a covalently bonded solid a germanium as it is well known silicon germanium they are the best examples of covalently bonded solids right. So, obviously, is a covalently bonded solid germanium is a covalently bonded solid now, what do you observe now? You have lot of electrons, right? Electronic charge density clouds or electrons here present in between the two germanium atoms, right? This is a line connecting the two germanium atoms. But on the other hand, in this say here in this region or in this region, there is a deficiency of the electron cloud, right? That should be seen and understood, right? You see that you do not have electron cloud here similarly electron cloud, but along this direction that joins the two germanium atoms you got a uh, lot of uh, electrons accumulated. So, it is called a directional bonding. Now, I think you should understand differ difference between the directional bonding and non directional bonding. Germanium and silicon they have the property namely directional bonding by directional bonding what I mean is the electron density that is present between the two atoms of uh, germanium or silicon the electron density present between the atoms is very large the bonding is directional right. But you, you do not have electron density in this the, in this region or in this region. So, along this distance this length that connects between the two atoms the density is large. So, electron density so the preferential uh, you know Direction dependence is there, right? So the along this direction, the density is uh, low. Along this direction, density is low, right? The electron clouds are absent. Now along this direction, only electron clouds are present. So this is a directional bonding. On the other hand, you go to ionic bonding. Ionic bonding, you don't have the direction dependence, right? Uh, and uh, because an electron is completely transferred, you have all the the electron cloud associated with uh, chlorine. And, and or sodium ok. Therefore, sodium atoms here and chlorine is here the electron density clouds are uh, present like this ok. Here uh, the electron the electronic charge density is um, non directional right. Whereas, in the covalently bonded solid it is the bond energy will be large in the case of diamond you know I told you in the case of diamond the melting point is high if the melting point is high the bond strength also should be high right. Tungsten 
you know in a metallic system the melting point will be high and the bond strength will be high right okay so the bond energy will be large in the case of a diamond diamond is an example of a covalently bonded solid right okay it is small in the case of bismuth but the important point is the directional bonding in the case of semiconductors the bonding is directional right that is what i told you now in the case of uh, germanium which is a semiconductor the electronic tendency is uh, found to be very large along this direction indicating that uh, the bonding is highly directional right that is a very important point electronic charge density contours in germanium crystal note the high degree of electron concentration between germanium germania atoms which indicates the directional bonding nature of the covalent solid right in any covalently bonded solid the bonding will be directional highly directional whereas in the metallic bonding there is no it is non directional again because the electrons will be moving here and there you know you have the free electron theory metals so in metals the electrons will be moving here and there so there will be no directional bonding right it is an highly it is non directional in metals the secondary bonding the bonding bond strength will, will be very small as i told you the metallic bonding the example is tungsten the melting point is large so the melting point is large means what the bond strength should be large okay the mercury is a liquid metal right you know mercury cesium they got uh, low melting points the yeah, mercury is already liquid right a liquid metal so the melting point will be you know the bond energy small and uh, they are all no, non directional in the secondary bonding the smallest the primary bondings will have the large bond energy and binding is very strong that is called the primary bonding the ionic covalent metallic they are all primary bonds where the bond energy will be large whereas in the case of secondary bonding like uh, you know van der waals bonding hydrogen bond in all these cases the bond energy will be small i will come to the magnitudes maybe in the next lecture then again that we directional interchain polymer intermolecular so to some extent it is a directional bonding now this gives a beautiful summary of uh, different kinds of systems how the bonding nature differs from one system to another system let us take the case of brass what is brass a brass is a, a, a alloy right it is a the metallic system primarily the alloy and uh, the bonding is uh, obviously metallic where do you find the metallic bonding if you ask a question like this all metals will have metallic bonding right the answer will be all metals will have metallic bonding so it is metallic since it is a metal alloy okay uh, so for br brass the bonding is metallic for rubber the bonding is covalent with some van der waals bond right very important point right the, the you know for rubber the secondary bonding van der waals bonding will be present and the primary bonding covalent bonding will be also will be present rubber is composed of primarily of carbon and hydrogen atoms so it is a combination of covalent bond and van der waals bond barium sulfide you know like uh, sodium chloride barium sulfide you know obviously charge neutrality barium will have will give two electrons to sulfur the ionically bonded solid so the bonding is predominantly ionic but there are some covalent character that should be that should be borne in mind the ionic character plus some covalent character on the basis of uh, relative positions of barium and sulfur atoms in the periodic table is the difference between the electronegativity of the two elements in the ba and s if you compare na and cl the electronegative will values will be differing by a larger magnitude then the bond strength also will be larger right the ionicity will be larger the bond strength will be larger for a solid xenon the bonding is van der waals as i told you just now the inert gases right what is the force that is acting between the molecules in a inert gas it is a van der waals bonding the inner van der waals force so uh, you have studied in the high school about uh, van der waals bonding between the molecules in a gas there is attraction and the attraction comes from uh, the van der waals force at the time of when it was proposed by van der waals he was not aware of uh, the origin of van der waals force but now 
in the paper by Morgino, which was written early in 1940s, that paper revealed the reason why inert gases should have dipole moments and uh, the attraction between dipoles which causes the attraction between the inert gas molecules right like um, xenon atom interacting with another xenon the attraction so on. So, xenon is uh, inert gas right for nylon you take nylon right nylon wire the bonding is covalent with some amount of uh, Van der Waals bonding right nylon is composed primarily of carbon and hydrogen for aluminum phosphide the indium phosphide or uh, gallium arsenide. Now, in these systems the bonding is covalent, but with some ionic character. Suppose somebody asks a question what is the bonding in semiconductor. Now, aluminum phosphide is a semiconductor gallium arsenide as all of you know the very important material is used as LED light emitting diode. The moment you see the light emitting diode you know if you if any person would have the tendency to say that the bonding in gallium oxide will be covalent, but it is a wrong answer. The bonding is covalent come some amount of ionic right. I will come to that point later it is a mixed bonding. So, similarly in aluminum phosphide in the semiconductor predominantly the bonding is covalent, but there will be some kind of ionic bonding also some percentage of ionic character will be there or fractional ionic character will be there in very many systems there will be fractional ionic character that makes you to go to what is called mixed bonding in most of the systems metallic systems and uh, semiconducting compounds the bonding is not uh, you know a mixed bonding in semiconducting systems you know the bonding is not all covalent right in some uh, monovalent systems like silicon and germanium the bonding is fully covalent, but in other cases there be certain amount of ionic character. Similarly, aluminum phosphide as I told you covalent come ionic right this is called a mixed bonding ok. There is a summary of different bonding types very very important. Let me now pass on to again the primary bonds and then compare with the secondary bond ceramics the bonding is ionic plus covalent bonding right the ceramic cup you take um, the pottery is right the ceramic cu coffee cup that is ionic plus covalent bonding the bond energy will be large the bond energy large means melting point will be large right the large modulus of elasticity small thermal expansion metals have large thermal expansion but ceramics will not expand upon heating right the metals you have the variable bond energy the metals uh, the bonding is obviously metallic bonding the moderate melting temperature, moderate elasticity, moderate alpha right. Polymers covalent plus secondary bonding, directional properties will be there, secondary bonding dominates a small melting temperature, small modulus and large thermal expansion. And you have the mixed bonding. Now, we move on to mixed bonding, the method by which the fractional ionic character could be obtained for a given system was uh, devised by Linus Pauling a double Nobel laureate and we will be now talking about the Pauling's formula which involves the electronegativity of the two participating atoms. I mentioned about gallium arsenide, gallium arsenide is a semiconductor, but gallium has got a a electronegativity which is different from that of arsenic or you take indium phosphide or indium telluride or you take NaCl, Na and Cl they will have different electronegativity values. You know sodium is electro positive, chlorine is uh, electronegative and fluorine is the super halogen right having the highest electronegativity value namely 4.0 in the Pauling scale which I will show you in the in a few moment uh, ok. The percentage of uh, ionic character in a system like uh, ionic covalent mixed bonding right I told you gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide is not uh, a fully covalent solid like silicon or germanium it has got primarily covalent and uh, partly there will be 
ionic character. The percentage of ionic character as I told you will be given in terms of uh, chi A or X A and X B. What are X A and X B? They are the electronegativity values of the two atoms A and B. What are A and B? A is gallium and B is arsenic. You take a binary compound like uh, gallium arsenide. X A refers to the electronegativity value of uh, gallium, X B refers to the electronegativity value of arsenic, right. Using this expression, you can determine the percentage of ionic character, right, the 100. So, percentage ionic character can be determined. So, X A and X B are the Pauling electronegativities, electronegativities given in the Pauling scale. There are several scales. So, you take the example of magnesium oxide right. Now, for magnesium the electronegativity value is 1.3, whereas oxygen is on the right side of the periodic table. The elements on the left side will be able to donate electrons. If you look at a periodic table on the left hand side you start with hydrogen, then you know lithium, sodium they are electropositive. You go to the right hand side the fluorine, chlorine, bromine, astatine they are highly electronegative. They are the electropositive, the electronegative. If you look at a periodic table, the the least electronegativity is possessed by cesium. The highest electronegativity is possessed by fluorine. For cesium it is 0 0.7, for fluorine it is 4.0. They are the two elements which you appear along the diagonal of the periodic table. Okay. So, the x value of m g is 1.3, o is 3.5 the ionic character will be 70.2 percentage right. So, remember in magnesium oxide it is generally considered to be a ionic solid. The percentage ionic character only 70.2 percentage the, uh, the ionic character right. Okay. Similarly, you can calculate for uh, uh, you know gallium and arsenic right. You look at uh, where, where, where do you find gallium arsenide? It is a 3 5 compound semiconductor right. You have the fourth group contains the your silicon germanium and all right this is the fourth one two three four the fourth group you got um, where do you, the silicon germanium right the fourth group elements let me now summarize the, uh, the the points that we discussed today with regard to the lecture and um, the summary goes like this the secondary bonding is present in all systems gases, liquids and solids, but the magnitude is very small. Secondary bonding is often neglected something like uh, you know diamagnetism in magnetic solids, electronic polarization in dielectric systems. So, like likewise uh, the among the in the bonding the primary bondings when you are considering the secondary bonding is often neglected because it is obscured because of the magnitude being small. Then the Leonard Jones potential is one of the best forms by which the interaction strength between the atoms and molecules can be in gases can be expressed right can be measured. The fraction ionic character as I told you is given by the Pauling's formula. As I mentioned just now silicon and germanium they are the, the they are perfectly covalently bonded solids there is no degree of uh, ionicity they are the monatomic solids uh, silicon, 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 germanium, germanium. So, silicon and germanium are highly fully covalent bonded solid unlike gallium arsenide, but gallium arsenide, indium phosphide have fractional ionic character and this occurs because of the fact that the two or having two different species having two different electro negativity values right. Okay. Then several important alloys the aerospace industry they make use of uh, nickel aluminide blades, titanium blades. Now, these materials have metallic bonding apart from that there is ionic bonding nature also right is very important thing you know uh, partially covalent metallic and so on. Okay. The, uh, the covalency comes again from the uh, electronegative difference. There are some systems in which all bondings are present I will come to that later. Mixed bondings can be understood from the excellent diffraction or uh, neutron diffraction. So, let us pass on to the question session. We have the following questions. The question number one, what is 
van der Waals bonding. Question number two, what is the bonding present in pure silicon? Question number three, what is the kind of bonding which is present in the semiconductor like gallium arsenide? Whether the metallic bonding is directional. With this, we come to the end of uh, today's lecture, the lecture number nine. Uh, the rest of the things we will see in the lectures to come. Thank you.